No, in Venezuela. 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 Deadly clashes at Venezuela's border. A la Venezuela consciente. Vamos a apostar por el bien de nuestro país. Venezuela. This is the Orinoco Belt, the heart of Venezuela's oil reserve. Venezuela is the first country in the world for the amount of oil deposits. Here gasoline is the cheapest in the world. In dollar a gallon is about 0.095 cents. Basically the government in Venezuela pays people to drive. Italy, why won't you never copy from the best ones? However, the contradiction is that today Venezuela is out of gasoline and the nearly 30 million citizens are forced to push cars by hand and to stand in line for hours if not days. While not having gone through a war or natural disaster, Venezuela has been torn apart by a severe humanitarian and economic crisis for years. Pharmacies without medicines, empty supermarkets, constant blackouts, shortages of drinking water, lines of citizens waiting to receive receive one single box of food per month from the government, a lawless state in the hands of drug trafficking clans, and one of the worst cases of inflation in history. Not so many months ago at 60,500%, where to have one single dollar in your pocket, you'd need to own this whole amount of Bolivar. All of this is Venezuela today. A gallon of milk in the US is $2.30. Correct me if I'm wrong, Google said so. Therefore, in Venezuela you'd need this amount of Bolivar. I don't even know how to pronounce it. <laughs> this is too much for those who are not native English speakers like me. Venezuela, besides being the only nation with two presidents, one elected Maduro and the other the self-proclaimed president at interim, Guaido, is also the only nation where a dollar can have two different values. For years the Venezuelan government has been distributing dollars at a favorable exchange rate of 6.3 Bolivar per one dollar only to a small elite. Entrepreneurs, military and large industrial groups. For the other people, the rest of the population, there's the black market. The black market strongly contested by the central government and in 2016, one dollar was exchanged for 1,200 Bolivars, an increase of 5,000% per year. But Venezuela wasn't always like this. It used to be a wealthy country, the richest in South America. So. How did it fail? Well, we can start off with a mix of three factors. The first factor is the corruption of the various local governments, all of them, from the first to the latest, regardless of whether they were socialist or not, and above all, their inability to properly manage oil resources. The second factor has been the external interference, an example of all the American sanctions, that in recent years have only served one purpose, to make the population die of hunger and disease. And finally, oil the blessing and curse of this country. Since Chavez came to power in 2002, the state oil company has cashed in over a trillion dollars from oil sales. Just think about it, more than 13 times the expenses of the Marshall Plan. And yet, the nation is in ruins. The paradox is that three centuries from now, when most of the world's oil is gone, Venezuela would still be able to extract it. Venezuela teaches us a very important lesson. Too much money, if mismanaged, can even be more risky than not having any money at all. I can take this risk. Thanks to oil in the 50s and 60s, Venezuela was among the 20 richest countries worldwide in terms of per capita income. The state provided cheap loans, subsidies, plenty of jobs and free public services, and ensured that an overvalued currency, the Bolivar, made imported goods easily accessible. In those years, everyone was able to get anything without too much of a trouble. Venezuela had all the typical characteristics of a profitable state. It was a rentier state where the higher the oil revenues were, the fewer the incentives to improve the national industry were. Where is Daddy, Mommy? We're here in the United States, and Daddy is down here in Venezuela. But by now he's down here where the Lake Maracaibo oil fields are. In Venezuela life changed on one exact day. July 31st, 1914, when a dark sticky liquid began to come out of the ground at a rate of more than 250 barrels per day. It was the Caribbean Oil Company, a branch of the Shell Oil Company, that on that day made a hole in the Maracaibo field. At that time, Venezuela was a nation without a minimum index of development and with a population of 2 million inhabitants, entirely dedicated to agriculture. The only law was the word of President Juan Vicente Gomez. For Mr. Gomez, oil was a real boon. Annual oil production exploded in the mid-twenties, from just over a million barrels to 137 million, making Venezuela second only to the United States. 
By granting crude oil concessions to all the Western companies that rushed to Venezuela, by the time of his death in 1935, Gomez had become one of the richest men in Latin America. It was also thanks to, or because of him, that Venezuela saw the rise of the militaries, which were financed with oil revenues. It is thanks to the goodwill of the Venezuelan army that Maduro fears no rival. When Gomez died, the oil revenues accounted for two-thirds of national income and more than 90% of the country's exports. Basically, Venezuela became the perfect target of a peculiar phenomenon, the Dutch disease. Economists know this disease very well. But oil transformed the lives of Venezuelans to the point of giving them unimaginable benefits in just 20 years. In 1952, when General Marcos Perez Jiménez obtained power with a coup d'etat, putting an end to the democratic experiment of the Trienio Adeco, Venezuela already looked like another country. This new period of shine was represented by the first national highway, wanted by Jiménez to connect the capital Caracas to the coastal city of La Guaira. Venezuela's good fortune was to have found the right hydrocarbon at the right time. Globally, the demand for oil skyrocketed during the post-war economic boom. The Middle East took care of the rest, pushing oil prices to record levels. The nationalization of the oil industry by Iran in 1951 and the overthrow of Mohammad Mossadegh two years later, as well as the closure of the Suez Canal by the president of Egypt, Nasser, attracted petrodollars to Venezuela. During the years Jimenez was in office, until 1957, no other country did better than Venezuela in terms of foreign capital accumulation. Venezuela did even better than West Germany, which at the time had enjoyed the Marshall Plan subsidies. Foreign investments in Venezuela tripled during the Jimenez regime, companies were free to invest, earn and return their money without obstacles of any kind. The golden rule to follow was this, go ahead, go. Go, go ahead and do business, but don't get in the way of my oppressive government. Signed, Mr. Jimenez. With petrodollars, the cost of living in Venezuela reached extremely high levels. An American who in the 50s earned $1,000 a month, today about $9,000, could barely make ends meet. Jimenez's ambitions not only led to the nation's name being changed from the United States of Venezuela to the Republic of Venezuela, but also promoted the creation of state-owned companies in the mining, steel and petrochemical industries, as well as schools, hospitals and homes for the poor. Everything had to seem up-to-date, impressive and elegant to attract foreign visitors. Skyscrapers, luxury hotels and villas sprouted up like mushrooms in Caracas, while the growth rate ended up averaging a plus 5% per year. The Venezuelan GDP per capita was for many years one of the highest in South America, and the Bolivar was the strongest and most stable currency in the area. Those who were poor didn't think twice to spend all of their money on goods like air conditioners, designer clothes and cable television. Hmm, that's what I call priority. Very few chose the path of saving money. The rich people too. The best way was always to borrow money. Buying the latest items seemed to be always a necessity. And as for the president uh, Jimenez, the big deal with him was repression. Jails were full of political opponents, workers and students' movements had all been shut down, and the military came under the spotlight of popular criticism. The loss of prestige for the military meant only one thing, to get Jimenez out of the way. There was no need for guns or bloodshed. It was more than enough to have an unfriendly chat behind closed doors with the military. In January 58, Jimenez and his family packed their bags and around 3 a.m. boarded a plane to the Dominican Republic. Their departure was so rushed that upon boarding, Jimenez left behind a suitcase with $2 million in cash. I wish I was at the airport at the time. Anyway, the main issue for Venezuela was the dilemma of how to ensure political stability. The answer came in the form of a pact, known as Pacto de Punto Fijo, an agreement between the three main Venezuelan parties, the Social Democrats, the Christian Democrats and the URD. The agreement led to the election of Romulo Betancourt. Betancourt delegated the diplomat Juan Pablo Pablo Pérez Alfonso to manage the national oil. Pérez Alfonso would later define oil as the devil's excrement. Pérez knew full well how mismanaged oil wealth could be detrimental to an entire nation, but he also knew that Venezuelans and not foreign oil companies should control it. His concerns were not left to chance. At the time, the Seven Sisters, the world's most powerful oil companies, dominated more than 80% of the crude oil reserves globally. To make things worse, the United States decided to limit oil imports from Venezuela, so to favor Canadian and Mexican crude. 
Perez Alfonso then proposed to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iran and Iraq the idea of entering into a private agreement, a cartel. And this is briefly the story of how the OPEC was created in 1960. With this move, between the 60s and 70s, the country became known as Saudi Venezuela. From neighboring Colombia, masses of citizens flocked to Venezuela's borders in hopes of making a new life. That's sadly ironical, because today the situation is quite the opposite. According to the latest data from the Center for Strategic International Studies, a diaspora of millions of Venezuelans flee every day from Venezuela to Colombia and Ecuador, around 4,000 people a day. At that time, however, Caracas had become such a fashionable destination that Air France operated a fast route to and from Paris in 1976 with a supersonic Concorde jet. Meanwhile, masses of people kept migrating from farms to cities. Agriculture was left behind, but the national demand for food was growing. As a result, the government was forced to import basic commodities to meet this demand. Wheat, corn, rice, basically products that Venezuela had been producing domestically up to that point. With a broken farming industry, the Venezuelan economy wasn't diversified and strong enough to provide employment for most people. This generated an increase in social spending, which the government had provided through subsidies, paychecks and public administration jobs to middle and low income Venezuelans. The various governments that have been in office, from Betancourt to Chavez, all reasoned in the same way. Venezuela could afford to survive without taxing its citizens. We have oil, so who freaking cares? Oil removed political accountability. Politicians used it to get the support from their voters, and voters used it as an excuse to get subsidies and have a living with it. As this wasn't enough, Paris doubled the state's payroll to more than 300,000 employees in five years, and in addition he passed a law prohibiting wrongful dismissal by all those companies that, unable to bear the costs, had no other option but to reduce staff. For this reason, the most logical choice for anyone who wanted to do business in Venezuela was to rely on government subsidies and loans. Why should I run a company with the risk of expanding too much in terms of production and personal and then not being able to fire people in case of need. Banana Republic. This was the term that, for example, the New York Times would use to define Venezuela. With the establishment of the state oil company PDVSA in 1983, the government finally took steps to nationalize the oil industry and put an end to most concessions to foreign companies. By the end of that year, Venezuela finally took possession of its golden goose. However, destiny, right in the middle of such an important event, ironically began to to present its bill. In 1988, a global oil surplus generated a contraction in demand for crude oil. This cut the price of Venezuelan oil from $35 to $14 per barrel. Since they grew accustomed to generous governments, Venezuelans still continued to spend even despite their declining salaries. The crisis fell on President Luis Herrera Campins, a former journalist who would later be remembered for stealing almost $6 billion from the state oil company. Facing the lower inflow of money into the country and the flight of foreign capital, campaigns tried to prevent the disaster in the so-called Black Friday of 1983, when it devaluated the purchasing power of the Bolivar by 75%. Well, that's what I call Black Friday, and not like that fake Black Friday. On that same day, any Venezuelan with savings immediately ran to exchange the Bolivar for any hard currency, whether it was dollar or not. But the restrictions on the circulation of money imposed by campaigns blocked any attempts to make capital flee overseas. A feeling of insecurity spread throughout the population and shaped an oppressive atmosphere of violence, quite different from the ease and well-being that had dominated the last 30 to 40 years. In short, Venezuela found itself without resources to pay for food imports. Recibo una Venezuela hipotecada. This was a major issue in a country where little was produced and much was consumed. Why breed cows when you could import the best meat from Argentina or Brazil? Why make things out of wood, iron and steel when you could buy them cheaply from Europe? For years, Venezuelans made the mistake of believing that to be entrepreneurs, it was enough to import goods and resell them at home at the higher prices. People in Venezuela were used to the idea of living in a rich nation that, thanks to oil, could and should give them everything. Citizens of Caracas were addicted to taking a plane and vacationing in Miami to go shopping. Esta barato, dame dos, it's cheap, give me two. This was 
essentially their motto. However, in 1989, bread, toilet paper, sugar, milk, flour, all basic necessities gradually began to disappear from supermarket shelves to reappear, almost magically I'd say, on the black market. So the Venezuela was so deep in debt that the government was forced to use almost 40 cents of every single dollar that he got from the oil sales to pay off its loans. It became very clear that Venezuela could no longer afford giving free money to its people. Empezamos a aplicar los correctivos en los precios de los productos nacionales. Un compromiso que tenemos ante el país, que no ante el fondo monetario internacional. The government this time no longer campaigns but again Paris cut public spending. Such a move inevitably led to widespread protests by thousands of citizens throughout the country. When in February 1989 the Paris government announced an increase in gas prices, the entire city of Caracas went to the streets in a series of riots and mass demonstrations. That event would become known in history as Caracaso and was just the beginning of the Venezuelan decline. Paris responded with the suspension of civil rights and imposed martial law. For Venezuelans, Paris became the symbol of total corruption, and partially they were right. Selling dollars at preferential rates had motivated officials to steal in many ways. Regarding Paris, we can say that the apple never falls far from the tree. In 1993, Paris was charged and found guilty of embezzling 17 million dollars from the state's funds. His conviction, though, made it possible for Hugo Chavez to rise to power six years later. Already in 1993, when he was still an unknown army paratrooper, Chavez had unsuccessfully attempted a coup against Paris. But having failed wasn't a problem for Chavez. Venezuelans didn't care so much that the military was once again dictating the timing of a government. What really mattered to them was getting a bit of welfare from that precious oil which seemed to be out of their hands now. Juro por Cristo, el más grande socialista de la historia. Patria, socialismo o muerte. Lo juro. And so Chavez rose to fame by building his reputation as a man who stood in open opposition to a corrupt and dying party. But Chavez, guys, is another chapter in the history of Venezuela. We don't have time to discuss about him right now, maybe in the future, but for now I just thank you very much for keeping me company until the end. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.